A former tax accountant who founded two startups, one a disaster and the other a huge success. What did she learn on the way to help her second attempt to be a success? Welcome to the Excellent Executive Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Katrina Burus, and today we have Sarah Sabin. Sarah, welcome. Hello, Katrina. Thank you for having me today. So Sarah has an interesting background. She was a former tax accountant who founded two startups. So in my mind, it's hard to put together a tax accountant with entrepreneurship. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Yes, you're not the first person to have said that. Often <laughs> often to surprise people in my day-to-day -day life, I will say I used to be a tax accountant. So my story is genuinely when I was at university, I was really interested in tax law. I just found it fascinating. And so I wanted to be a tax accountant. And that was the start of my corporate career. So in general, I was in the corporate world for nine years. I trained as a tax accountant, and then I went to work in a multifamily office where I was leading a team that was looking after high net worth individuals and families. And basically what happened or what started the period of transition was what I call the seeds of unrest. So about two years before I left the corporate world for good, I um, started feeling unhappy at work. And it wasn't something that I thought, well, I can move to another job and that will fix all my problems. I knew it was something deeper going on. So that was the first time in my life that I'd had that real introspection and moments of reflection. Great. And yes. And then what triggered it? Do you know what? Even looking back, I don't know what the exact trigger was. It was a buildup of feeling that happened over a period of time. And when I talk to leaders in the corporate world that are thinking of transitioning or starting up their own business, it's quite often not a major trigger. It's just a growing sense of unease that happens over a period of time. And it tends to get stronger over time, this feeling that for whatever reason, something isn't quite right. So that's what I had. And I decided to listen to it. And as it so happened, a friend of mine said at that point in my life, hey, do you want to co-found a startup? What kind of startup? So my first startup, my co-founder of Context was a medical doctor. And she wanted to found a startup where we provided services to medical doctors that wanted to transition in their careers in the UK. And we basically provided all these online resources. We did networking events and conferences. We did recruitment. And the timing was really, really good because there was a lot of furore going on in the UK amongst junior doctors and the National Health Service. So whilst we were doing that, I thought to myself, right, I'm going to prepare to transition out of the corporate world for good and go and work on this startup full time. So that's what I did. At the end of 2015, I left the corporate world, and I went to work full-time on Medic Footprints. Okay. And then how did that fare out? So I would say that startups are a baptism of fire. And what I didn't realize, and one of the major learnings that I had from that experience was if your vision and your co-founder's vision for the business are not in alignment it will lead to problems down the line. So what kind and of problems did you have with your co-founder? 
Well, exactly what happened was we had a team, the leaders of that team, but because we couldn't agree on anything, we were bickering all the time. We used to send passive aggressive emails to each other. Nothing was getting done in an effective, streamlined way because we were constantly at odds with each other. And so this basically culminated in me making the decision that if we couldn't agree on the vision and direction of the business, then it was time to part ways. And so at the end of 2016, I made what was actually a difficult decision to say to my co-founder, here, this is your business. I'm going to retain a small shareholding and I am going to move on and do something else. So that's what I did. She is still running the business up until this day. And the absolutely crucial learning for me there was you have to have alignment amongst the leaders of a business. Otherwise, it's going to lead to a really fractious relationship and confusion amongst you know, everyone else on the team. Right. And then you say that you need to have laser focus in business to succeed. Is that what you refer to, that the leadership team is totally aligned to the vision and everything that you support entrepreneurs is to focus, to have this laser focus on the vision and the purpose? That is part of it. When I speak about laser focus, I'm talking about a few different things, but yes, that vision to have focus on that is really key because everything else flows from that. So if you cannot agree on the ultimate direction, you're going to be at odds. Okay, so you align the leadership team on the vision mission. What's the next step after that? So... I'm going to basically just kind of go on to my second business and kind of respond to that in context. So when I went to start my second startup, I decided that I would do things differently. So I would get really, really focused on what I was trying to build, who I was trying to build it for. Because I started it as a sole founder before I grew out the team, I was very clear on what I was trying to achieve. And the problem there arose because I had made the right kind of decisions for the wrong reasons. So I'm very open when I'm talking about my second startup that it was something to prove a point to people. So... Essentially, I was trying to prove a point to the world that I could run a small tech startup. I was trying to prove a point to my ex-co-founder that I could go ahead and succeed without her. And so when we're talking about focus, you also need to understand the why behind it. So that kind of ties into the vision. Why are you choosing to focus on that particular vision? Does it come from the right place or does it come from the wrong place? So how do you evaluate whether it's coming on the right place or the wrong place? Can you give an example with your second business? And I guess, are you inferring that maybe you didn't have the right purpose because you wanted to show her that you could succeed instead of really focusing totally on the company? So yes, my modus operandi up until that point in my life had been all about proving people wrong. So I call these things negative motivators versus positive motivators. So I started that business with a negative motivator, something that I realized in hindsight. When it comes from a place of proving people wrong or proving to the world that you're successful or some other negative motivator. That means that it doesn't come from a positive motivation place, which is you're doing something for the love of doing it. You're doing something to make an impact. You're doing something to make a specific contribution. So what I realized in retrospect, looking back at that experience, 
is that it came from a negative motivation place. And I think it's helpful for people to kind of assess the language that they use around why they're doing something. So are they doing it really for reasons that fire them up or are they doing something to prove a point to the entire world that they can do something? So what helped you realize that? What it was in your language that you noticed that made you more aware that, in fact, it was to prove that you could do it instead of an intrinsic motivation of wanting to help? So actually, in the language that I use, it was always sort of, oh, well, I'm going to try and make this work. And I kind of vacillated between I'm going to try and make it work and I'm definitely going to make it work because I have a point to prove and I'm going to get funding and I'm going to build a team. And it was completely sort of me, me, me focused. But the other more important thing here was the emotions or feelings around it. So over two and a half years, I was chronically stressed. I was anxious all the time. I was working crazy hours, near burnout twice. And I always felt like misaligned with what I was trying to do. And it was much more of a feeling thing that made me have that realization. Because after two and a half years, I saw myself going down a dark path, feeling wise, if I carried on in that way. Yeah, I see. So what made you make a shift? Was it a growing feeling or was it a point in time that you said, okay, I can't go on like this? Or was another opportunity that was offered to you that you took because of this realization? So I had this realization after about two years, but there was a crunch point. And the crunch point came when my co-founder, again, built a team around me, brought on a co-founder and he rang me up one day. I remember I was in Heathrow Airport and he said to me, Sarah, it's great. I've got this investor. He's going to put in loads of money so that we can get to the next stage. And I cannot describe it as anything other than my heart sank. So I started really seeing the dark path ahead and you know obviously you think in that situation one would have expected me to feel happy elated etc but it was the complete opposite and I had a very strong feeling that if I took that money I would be going down definitely a burnout path and as it was quite frankly all of the relationships in my life, familiar relationships, partner relationships were starting to fall apart around me. So I saw those going downhill over time as well. And so ethically, I couldn't take that money. And that for me was the real crunch point. And at that point in time, I didn't know what else I would do instead. But I knew that I needed to take some time and not start anything new before I really had some kind of more positive motivation. So I took a two-month gap. And it was at that time that I came across transformational coaching. And for me, it was life-changing. So it really gave me a light bulb moment, a kind of sense of purpose of, wow, coaching can have this kind of impact on people. And I then said, okay, well, what if I could do this coaching? And what if I could, you know, build up the kind of business that I love and really want to do? And it comes from that place of positive motivation. So that's what really started me on my journey. But I needed to take that step back first. I see. So, but two months is not that long to have a whole new idea of how to start a new business. But you came across during those two months about transformational leadership. Is that it? 
Well, it's transformational coaching in general, which can take various forms. The kind of coaching that I do now, transformational leadership coaching, mostly for high growth entrepreneurs. But at that time, it was just the general concept of examining your internal world, understanding your mindset, understanding the way that you perceive the world, understanding your belief system that was particularly life-changing for me. But you're right, Katrina. I mean, two months is not a long amount of time. It's what, it's how long it took me. But that process could take weeks, it could take months, it could take years. Wow, yes. Well, good for you for having the courage and the enthusiasm to find something new, the courage to stop and the enthusiasm to really say, okay, I know what it takes to be an entrepreneur. It's really the feeling inside, the motivation and the purpose that needs to be addressed. And when you found it, I guess you were very enthusiastic and you knew how to start a business for sure. Yeah, I mean, that missing piece for me, the actual positive, yeah, I love this. This is really exciting. That's what had always been missing for me before. And so how has it affected your business now that you're enthusiastic about what you're doing? So I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I wish I could say this. I'm not going to say that just because you have that kind of vision and purpose that everything is easy. It's not. It was, you know, still the process that you have to go through of building a business because at the end of the day, if you want to do what you love most of the time, then you need to take care of, you know, your financial needs as well. So what the coaching business has reinforced for me is why laser focus is so important. Because what I found was as I progressed through my business, the more I did, so the more diversified my activities became, the less the business grew. And I see this in my own business and I see it in my clients' businesses as well. Because as entrepreneurs, the tendency is shiny object syndrome and trying to focus on too many things at once. And to be honest, if you had unlimited time, unlimited resources, unlimited money, then why not choose to do a <laughs> hundred different things at once? But for most businesses, that isn't the case. So that's why laser focus does become important. Yes, I think it's a good thing to even ask a leader at the end of the year what you want to be known for, and then really help the person focus. Because sometimes, I mean, it's understandable, leaders are hired for change. And then once they're in the company, well, they want to change the quicker, the better. And they start, like you say, running after shiny objects, doing too many things too quickly. And at the end, people perceive, can perceive their leader as a chicken without their head. And they don't know, really, they don't remember what actually that person did. And yet they've been working night and day on the company. So yeah, I think your good. laser focus, you know, is very important. Yeah. And the other effect it has is if a leader is not laser focused, their team gets confused as well. Not only is the leader perceived as a headless chicken, you've got loads of people just running around doing things without sort of any real context or rhyme or reason behind it. Great. Yeah. So you help leaders be laser focused on their vision and not run after shiny objects, right? Yes. Um, I think just to maybe go into a little bit more detail on why laser focus is key, because number one, if you want to master anything, you need to focus on it consistently over a period of time and do it consistently. And if you are trying to master a hundred different things at once, you will not be mastering anything in particular. It also feeds into productivity. So the Pareto principle states that 
20% of our activities produce 80% of our results, but a lot of people don't really understand what the 20% of their activities that create the impact are. And then the other key point with laser focus is just if you are focused, you are more effective and productive, and therefore you are less likely to become overwhelmed, stressed, burned out, because that's the other kind of side effect of if you are trying to do too many things at once. Yes, very good point. To self-manage, uh, yeah, absolutely. And there's quite a few that do burn out, and you've had that experience as well. So luckily you came out of it. Well, we're coming to the end of our podcast. I wanted to know, where can people get a hold of you? So you can visit me at my website, which is sarahsabin.com, all one word. I am very active on LinkedIn as well under Sarah Caroline Sabin. And you can connect with me or drop me an email. Thank you very, very much, Sarah. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me on today, Katrina. Great. Thank you for listening to the Excellent Executive Coaching Podcast. You can subscribe to all future podcasts at excellentexecutivecoaching.com. Join us each Wednesday to learn more about the latest trends in leadership techniques and bring your coaching to the next level. To learn more about Dr. Burris's CEO Mastermind, use the contact form at excellentexecutivecoaching.com.